Hi, my name is Peter Coffin, and uh, I guess Gamergate 2 is happening, which all of these outlets don't want. Yeah, there's this consultancy company called Sweet Baby that does diversity, equity, and inclusion in video games. People have caught wind to the fact that it's involved in a lot of games that have some weird diversity moments in them. Another white asshole deciding what I get to do, how I get to do it. It made a bunch of people mad, and rather than ignore it, uh, gaming outlets have gone full on, this isn't what it looks like. And I think that a lot of what Gamergate was about is that. Gamergate started when outlets rallied around a single thing to say it wasn't what people were saying it was. They saw the media frame something in a way that was nebulous. But I'm entirely uninterested in relitigating any of that. So let's talk about Sweet Baby. Here is how Sweet Baby is being represented. Sweet Baby doesn't do what some gamers think it does. No, one company isn't forcing diversity into all your favorite games. Now, according to Kotaku, critics of Sweet Baby say that the company is directly responsible for failed games like Suicide Squad, not the studios that employed them in the first place, but because of the content Sweet Baby forces into games. Now, to me, it kind of seems like if that's the actual claim, then they wouldn't be talking about Alan Wake 2, which is a massively successful game. They actually alleged, because of Sweet Baby's involvement, that Saga Anderson, the protagonist of that game, was black. Which the director said is not the case. I'm gonna say, I think Saga Anderson actually is a great character. I think Saga Anderson being black is actually a really good aspect of the character because it adds a lot of depth. It allows her to be the daughter of Mr. Door, which opens up a ton of narrative possibilities for what comes next. And I really like that. And I really like that. But there are some points in the story where Saga Anderson kind of just says some very random DEI shit that is weird and seems like it doesn't belong at all. Sometimes even feels like it contradicts the character a little bit. I don't want to get into it specifically because I don't know what Sweet Baby was exactly involved in consulting on that game. But I believe that diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives ultimately serve capital. I think they're a means to further the human resources paradigm, a paradigm that supersedes genuine union activity where employees band together to demand things from the company while simultaneously making employees think that the company's on their side. I do believe that it's part of an ideology that ultimately reinforces segregation. I think that solidarity across racial lines doesn't happen when people can't ask stupid questions or talk to each other slightly insensitively. I think DEI works to uh, avoid structural critique. I wrote this book because I don't think the right critique works and I don't think the left critique works. I think they're both ridiculous. But like all these articles saying Sweet Baby doesn't do this thing, um, completely ignore that Sweet Baby tells you that they do that thing. I'm Kim Belair. I'm a writer, I'm a narrative designer, I'm extremely nervous, and I'm the co-founder of a little narrative development company called uh, Sweet Baby Inc. We do narrative development in games and kind of beyond, and we try to bring a lot of inclusion, diversity, and new ideas kind of to the industry. A pseudo fun fact about me, that's slightly fun, is that I actually have a marketing degree. That doesn't make you sound good. Marketing is propaganda, and generally, marketing done on behalf of capital is capitalist propaganda. <laughs> and so I want to put on that, like, very mercenary hat for a second and talk about the way that we decide how we're going to sell the art that we make and how we're going to approach the audiences that we make it for. Because I think so often when people like us get told, you know, from higher ups or from society at large, this isn't what players want, it's not a conversation about demographic, sorry, content, it's a conversation about demographics. And I think that in our industry and in so many creative industries, if you want to look at film and television and any art form, we start treating our core demographics as a fixed and static value, something that does not want to change and something that is locked in place. So despite like the changing face of audiences, despite the 
changing face of conferences like this one, we still look at our core demographics and say, okay, they're white, cis, hetero males. And we cater almost exclusively to them. The argument that she is making here is not that demographics change, because demographics do change. It is that the industry should be marketing to more people. It needs to be manufacturing demand amongst more demographics. I don't know if she would think that's what she's saying, but that's what she's saying. And the core demographic, the one that has been marketed to and the social contract with has essentially been solidified over time, she essentially denigrates that demographic. And the problem is that we don't just cater to them like, you know, here, here's something that we think you'll enjoy. We cater them the way that we cater to like a picky baby. We feed them the same thing that we know that they love and we keep on feeding it. We're like, here you go. We, you love it. Eat this, eat this, eat this. So that then when they get anything else, they react as a picky baby would, which is be like, whoa, no, thank you. I do not want this. And we've actually done this so long that what we're doing is creating an entire nation of picky babies and they make us scared to deviate from what we actually want to do. Just in case these picky babies don't want to play our games. This analogy is total bullshit. Firstly, it says that you have control over what people like. And secondly, it says that you don't have control over what people like. If we're actually going to call the gaming public picky babies, then we have to understand that what she's advocating for is better parenting, which... Uh, I don't think she has any experience with parenting. Otherwise, she wouldn't be using this. This. So I'm going to go ahead and get into the issue from my perspective. What allows this type of person to start companies and succeed is that there is a grain of truth to what she's getting at. Fandom and consumerism are kind of the driving ideologies of how we do things today. These companies do have an agenda of training a mindless army of people who will do whatever they want. They do that by uh, putting their consumable, the commodity, at the center of these people's identity. And they create expectations along those paradigms that this woman would characterize as picky baby shit. But this stuff is ideology. It is actually not how the majority of the public acts at all. It's how whales act. Now, a whale is a term that came from gambling. It basically refers to a high roller, somebody who spends a lot of money. I'll use some information from a recent presentation, What Are Mobile Game Whales and How to Catch Them? by Mihovil Hruik. If I'm saying that wrong, uh, I tried my best. The term whale carries significant weight in the gaming industry. When we talk about a whale in gaming, we're referring to a distinct group of players who stand apart for their spending habits. These are not your average players. A mobile game whale is someone who spends far more than the typical player, often contributing a substantial portion of a game's revenue. More specifically, mobile game whales contribute an astounding 50 to 70% of a mobile game's in-app purchase revenue, even though they represent only about 1 to 2% of the total player base. This disproportionate contribution underscores their importance in the mobile gaming revenue model. Of course, understand that this presentation is referring to the mobile games industry, but this is applicable industry-wide. Here is where you start to understand where something like Sweet Baby comes in. What a company like this exists to do is to curate diverse whales. A diverse whale is a person uh, probably from the upper middle class. Keep in mind, I don't use this definition of class, but to understand what income bracket we're talking about. It's a person of that type of background who is also from a historically marginalized group. It's somebody who understands the history of racism, but is ultimately from a fairly comfortable background and understands things through this supply and demand representation based idea that we vote with our dollars. It is not a person with the background of an actually poor uh, black person, gay person, etc. Somebody who actually experiences these identities as a pressure release valve. But Sweet Baby isn't about fixing stuff like that. It's about making games that people with money will buy. If you understand this type of information, this stuff here sounds different.
picky baby would, which is be like, whoa, no, thank you. I do not want this. And we've actually done this so long that what we're doing is creating an entire nation of picky babies, and they make us scared to deviate from what we actually want to do. What we have to understand is that Sweet Baby's goal is to cater to the money-having and money-spending upper-middle-class PMC labor aristocracy person from a historically marginalized group who feels like it's worth rewarding companies for saying the thing. Training diverse whales. This lady doesn't want to get rid of the whiny babies. She wants more diverse whiny babies. I think we need to step out of this rule that like white men can enjoy fantasy worlds, aliens, sci-fi, monsters, anything, so long as it's through a lens that looks exactly like them. Because if that's the kind of person that we're always going to cater to, you're never going to innovate. You're never going to change things. You're just going to keep feeding the picky baby. Again, she wants different picky babies. Whales. Usually people who are being taken advantage of. Like, yes, I painted them as comfortable consumers, but ultimately the idea is to exploit them much harder than the majority of the customers. The hardcore fan is always going to spend more money than the majority. Industries like this are set up around whales. That's why they push so hard for games as a service. Um, not because they think giving away games for free works better, because it clearly doesn't. Most people hate the shit out of these games as a service games. But why, oh why, is Suicide Squad, Kill the Justice League, employing Sweet Baby? Because they're out for whales. And the thing is, companies aren't resistant to having more whales. They like whales. They want more whales. That's why companies aren't afraid of hiring this type of consultancy company. By employing Sweet Baby and going after diverse whales, they don't look like they're going after whales. They look like they're fighting racism. They're not fighting racism. These types act like, oh, it's so hard to get these companies to want to change. And it's like, well, no, what's difficult isn't getting these companies to want more whales. What's difficult is making it look like that's not what you're doing. That's the point of all of this forever. It's always that. It's a woke Ouroboros, a concern that's eating its own tail. Again, it's targeting people of diverse backgrounds to exploit. So these gaming outlets and game companies and all that, they act like they don't want Gamergate too, but they do. They want the fight. Do you know why? Because the fight is not about whales. The fight is about who the ideal consumer is. And if you have a reactionary force saying diversity is evil, we're the cishet white men that are being left behind, then those are the two sides. I have a documentary called Representation Matters, right? Which touches on a lot of this kind of stuff. It shows how representation is a kind of a bullshit concern that ultimately curates capital-friendly people of historically marginalized groups. It's almost like I've been saying this stuff for a real long time. Woke Ouroboros, my book, this is probably my masterwork on this subject. Uh, I, I actually kind of thought its time came and went, but uh, no, this, this really, really does it, I think. So I have a feeling this isn't going to be the only video about Gamergate 2, but... Uh, at least you know where I'm coming from. I renounce my involvement with the left side of that. Really the left as a whole. I think the left is horseshit. But I also want the right not to think that their conclusions were correct. However, uh, yeah, the media is lying to you. Also, yes, diversity is a red herring. Just not the way that you think it is. I'm going to ask everybody to please consider the way that I've framed it. And to understand that... Culture war is ultimately uh, not going to solve any of the legitimate concerns that anybody has, whether those concerns are traditionally aligned with the left or the right. Uh, it's just going to subsume them and take them somewhere that doesn't change anything. Also, 
wherever it goes, it's going to be tremendously irritating regardless. That's all I got for you today. Um, lick the video, slurp all over them buttons, become a subscriber, maybe even consider becoming a Patreon money me, um, money now, me a money needing a lot now. Hope you have a good day. Bye.